Good morning, mga kapatid. Grace and peace in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and God our Father. We will praise you, O Lord, with all our hearts. We will sing your praises. We bow down before you, and we will praise your name for your love and for your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. Let us come and worship Him. With all our hearts, with all our soul, with all our mind, and all our strength. When the music fades, no is stripped away and I simply come longing just to bring something that's upward that will bless your heart I bring you more than a song for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within, through the way things appear, you're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about you it's all about you jesus i'm sorry lord for the thing i made it and it's all about you and it's all about you jesus in this world no one could express how much you deserve though I'm weak and poor all I have is yours every single breath I bring song for a song in itself is not what you have required you search much deeper within through the way things appear you're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about you it's all about you Jesus I'm so in love for the thing I made it and it's all about you it's all about you Jesus coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about you it's all about you Jesus I'm so Lord for a thing I made it and it's all about you when it's all about you Jesus Sorry for all the things that I've made It's all about you Lord Bring you more than a song I bring you more than a song
I bring you more than a song. I bring you more than a song. You're looking into my heart, into my heart. You're looking into my heart, into my heart. Coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it. It's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. Draw me close to you Never let me go I lay it all down again To hear you say that I'm your friend You were my desire No one else will do There's nothing else can take your place To feel the warmth of your Help me find a way, bring me back to you. All I want, you're all I've ever needed. You're all Draw me close to you And never let me go I lay it all down again To hear you say that I'm your friend You were my desire Nothing else can take your place To feel the warmth of your embrace Help me find a way Bring me back to you You're all I want You're all I ever needed You're all I want Help me know you only Help me know you
Let's just come before this God of ours and pray. Let's do that. Father, <clears throat> you see all things perfectly. And the, the crisis so-called that we are uh, in, uh, so much of it man-made ultimately finds its, its birthplace in your will, in your will. For you have moved the chess pieces around to culminate, to, to uh, result in making this decision um, so that people's souls would, would be shaken, so that people would contemplate more carefully with, with greater uh, focus uh, their spiritual lives and, and uh, what is to come in the future. Uh, thank you that you have done this, Father. Uh, thank you that you've protected us, that you've um, uh, been our guide, that you've been our strength, and you continue to be so. And we praise you that we have a Father like you who is intimately concerned and involved in the lives of his people. As we go into your word, Father, we ask for much grace. Uh, give us to see by your Spirit. Give us to receive Give us to profit. Give us to respond in an honoring way. And we ask it all in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. And amen. Um, by way of introduction, um, you know, a work of fiction, a book, it was published in 1951. And it was written by an author by the name of John Wyndham. And it was called The Day of the Triffids. And there's actually a movie that has been made uh, out of this book some years back. And it's a book that I read some three, four years ago, give or take. And in it, John Wyndham imagines what it'd be like if bushes would, would come to life and would uh, be able to actually move by uh, removing their, uh, um, their roots from the soil and, and allowing that, a certain mobility to take place, however slow it might be. And the story unfolds uh, that these bushes uh, have ulterior motives. They're thinking beings, if you will, and began on a rampage to attack human beings and, and have at their disposal a sort of spray gas that, that they can, they can uh, uh, let out, and, and it, again, it affects people, eventually resulting in their death. And so it's really a, a destructive uh, uh, result. Um, what if God had made trees able to walk? Nothing is beyond the capacity of our God, we know that. And God in his creativity, in his ingenuity, in his power, in his wisdom would have been able to make such a thing happen. He hasn't that we know of anywhere in this world. We don't know about other worlds, but certainly not here. But he's given us the power of imagination. So think for a moment what it would be like for a tree to be able to walk. That whenever they needed to, for whatever reason, they could become mobile and go in particular directions. And as I was doing some research uh, on this, I came across a story uh, out of India where there was a, an area uh, uh, filled with trees that were to be cut down uh, soon. And uh, the next day, uh, they're all missing. The trees have gone missing. Apparently, have, they've been uprooted uh, nobody knows what happened to the trees except that they're not there. And it's not because they've been cut down because there's no evidence of any cutting having happened. And so this man comes along and testifies and guarantees that he witnessed the whole thing. And according to him, these trees took up and left <laughs> and walked away on their own in order to avoid the disaster to come. So whatever you might think of the story, uh, the idea or the perception, even if only in our imaginations, of trees walking, actually finds a biblical connection. And uh, it's found in Mark 8, verses 23 to 24. And it says, And he, that is Jesus, took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village and when he had placed saliva on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked him, 
do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see people, but they look like trees walking. <laughs> of course, there are no trees walking, and the man knew there were no trees walking, but they looked like trees walking because his vision hadn't been regained yet perfectly. And with a second touch of the Lord, it was uh, brought back to a normal vision. Walking trees. Imagine that if only, right? But you know, the idea of walking trees serves a biblical purpose by providing us with a metaphor for life. A place that uses a tree as an illustration is found in the very first uh, psalm. Uh, out of the 150 psalms, Psalm 1 and although the tree is not specifically said to walk, it's here linked with representing a man. And a man most assuredly does walk. And the psalm reads this way. I'm going to read all six verses. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. I want to take a look at this text by using the metaphor of a tree that is enabled to walk as we employ our imaginations a little bit. And I want to ask the question, as we do so, <coughs> if a tree could walk, where would it go? Why would it go there? And what would the end result be? To that end, I have three points, and they are as follows. Firstly, where a man tree walks depends on what he's attracted to. Secondly, where a man tree walks decides the level of his prosperity. Thirdly, where a man tree walks determines his final destiny. And I've entitled this message, Walk of the Man Tree. Firstly, where a man tree walks depends on what he's attracted to. We find this in verses 1 and 2, the first third of our psalm. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. You know, blessing accompanies wise decisions. And wise decisions go hand in hand with good character. To be blessed is to be on the receiving ends of good end results. And the kind of man that is being described here as blessed is one that can't find pleasure in three things. And the three things are to walk in the counsel of the wicked, number one. Secondly, to stand in the way of sinners. And thirdly, to occupy the seat of scoffers. Those are the three things that the blessed man, the man who is righteous, cannot find pleasure in. And note the, the, the threefold description of the man who enters into these areas uh, has a certain gravity, a certain direction to it. There is a progression in the hold of evil upon the man who decides to venture where he should not go. 
First, we're told that he walks. Secondly, that he stands. And finally, that he sits. And slowly, we find that the, the unrighteous man who has entered into forbidden ground has become accustomed to evil. And so much so that he uh, finds its ways, gets used to its ways as normal, and kind of makes his peace with being there. From walking to standing, we're told, is the first phase. And that means that something has grabbed his interest to the point of stopping. From stopping to sitting means that he has gotten comfortable and is now at home with the lowest ways of men. And furthermore, there isn't only a development in how comfortable he's gotten with evil, with the idea of wrongdoing, but there's also a development in the nature of that evil or the intensity of that evil or how that evil, evil expresses itself. It, first, there's wicked or wickedness. Secondly, there's sinners. And thirdly, there are scoffers. Now, we need to understand better what these words would have meant in the Hebrew language within which they were written so that we can best understand the degradation, the, the going lower of, of the kind of evil that these words imply. First, we have wicked. The Hebrew word for this, for this word means lawlessness. It's, it describes one who answers only to himself and no one else. The law of God, the rules of God, the regulations of God, the will of God does not apply. It doesn't enter his mind, and if it did, he would reject uh, uh, the thought immediately. And so we find that he is a man who has considered himself accountable to himself alone, to his own ideas of, of what's right and wrong and what it is that he wants to do. And we find this in how Jesus described the Pharisees. In Matthew 23, verses 27 to 28, Jesus, pointing out the scribes and the Pharisees, says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs with, uh, which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they're full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. So you too outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness that you're really not answering to God, that you're really not following God, that you're really not obeying God. You are a law unto yourselves. You are men of lawlessness. Then we have sinner. And this means one who has entered into a habitual kind of sinning as a lifestyle. It's become a part of what he does. This become, it, it's characteristic of him. It's a level below being lawless, right? Things have really, really degraded. Now it's, it's a deeper level into depravity. It's the natural result of having made the choice to, to have no laws or, or standards of any kind. Romans 1 describes this mindset. Romans 1, verses 31 to 32, where Paul, describing the world, describing sinners in the world, says, they are senseless, faithless, heartless, merciless. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things are worthy of death, they not only continue to do these things, but also approve of those who practice them. These are beings who have, who have dived into the pool of wickedness, and that is their habitation. That is where they swim as a lifestyle. And then there's the scoffer. And this means someone who is in such grip of evil that they not only sin as a lifestyle, which is the earlier description, they have now res decided to mock and to, and to violate and to uh, uh, make fun of that which is holy and righteous and that which is of God. And so this, again, goes, is a, a level below that of, of being simply a sinner whose lifestyle 
has become that. This is now somebody who ridicules and takes great pleasure in ridiculing that which is righteous and holy. Solomon had this to say about scoffers in Proverbs 21, verse 24. A proud and haughty man, scoffer is his name. He acts with arrogant pride. And so all of this, all of these three areas where the unrighteous would dare to go, but the righteous can't even imagine tolerating uh, being in those kinds of situations, all of these things are in the end destructive. None of this has any power to build or to bless. And the righteous man has made the decision that he will not place himself in the company of these people to be seduced by their ways, to be affected by their ways, to be contaminated by their ways. The man tree, as we've now begun to call him, wishes for himself better soil than this. This kind of soil ultimately is corrosive and contrary to life. So he searches for a better dwelling place or a place to inhabit, to live in. And this leads to the fourth thing. Finally, the one thing that the man who is righteous, the man tree, can finally find pleasure in, so much so that it says that he delights in this one thing, verse 2. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. You know, the word law here doesn't mean only the law of Moses, which would have been central to this. It's somewhat more than that. It, here it means all of God's ways, all of God's revealed ways, all of God's godly ways. This, the righteous man, has made a conscious decision to seek. This is where the man tree would walk and go it's something that's completely contrary to the previous three things that have been described, right? The things that he avoids, the things that he cannot accept because they are in conflict with his own heart's desire. Here in this fourth area, the area that he delights in, there is no lawlessness. In fact, we see the very opposite. Here is a seeking to be governed by God's ways and by God's guidelines, what God thinks matters, what God finds acceptable is important to this man, to this person. And so he seeks it. Here in this fourth area, there is no sinning as a lifestyle. There is instead a purposeful seeking of God's standards so that the righteous man, as his heartbeat is that, might not sin against God, whether knowingly or unknowingly. And finally, thirdly, here in this fourth area, there is no scoffing. There is no mocking. There is no ridiculing of holy things. And rather than that, there is a drawing close to holy things. There is a drawing close to the God of holy things, to things that are pure and righteous and wholesome. On the ways of God, we are told, he meditates, or in the law of God, he meditates day and night. You know, this is the description of a man who isn't satisfied to simply flirt with the things of God or with his devotion to God kind of in a superficial way. This is a man who has made a decision to dive in uh, wholeheartedly into the ways of God. And so he makes it his business to invest himself into that which will revive his soul. No investment of ourselves, Scripture gives us to understand, and of our time in, the, in God's Word will ever return void without uh, bringing great advantage and great blessing. And believing this, he meditates, we are told, on this dew from the heavens, of, on this truth from God that has come down to men, God's word. 
He meditates on this. To meditate means to consider carefully, to evaluate wisely. It means to drink it in slowly, to savor and to taste the quality of what is being drunk in. He's not scanning God's Word. He's absorbing God's Word. And he's absorbing God's Word until finally it becomes a part of him. It has entered his soul, his being, his mind. It has now begun to affect him in all of its ways. And in the end, blessing comes his way. And this is why the psalm begins, blessed is the man, of course, before giving the description of why blessing has come to him. And then secondly... Where a man tree walks decides the level of his prosperity. Verses 3 and 4. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. And then verse 4 Conversely, meaning the opposite of the wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. The writer of this psalm now enters into a description, an illustration, if you will, of what kind of man this is. He is like a tree, we're told. And so our man-tree metaphor comes to life here. We find out the trees are not self-sufficient like, like the rest of creation. Nothing in creation, including the angelic order or any other kind of creature or being, is independent of the need of God and the, the sustenance that God uh, brings. And so uh, nothing is independent, nothing is self-sufficient. And where a tree, out of a number of different things, is uh, not independent of is its need for rain, right? In other words, a tree is dependent on water for survival. But what if a tree could walk? Where would that tree choose to go? A tree that was not already planted or, or sown into a, ri a riverbank where it can absorb the humidity from those shores, would it not go towards a more favorable and steady situation? A location where it was not so dependent on timely rain having to come and to make a difference for its survival, but would have access to constant water. In other words, as the description gives us to understand, a riverbank that would allow, the conditions would, allow the tree to fulfill its destiny, its reason for being as a tree, to become the tree it was meant to be, to bring into reality all that the tree was designed to be and to do, for nothing God creates is not without purpose. And that brings us into what the writer says next in this metaphor of the tree, uh, really a simile. A simile is a type of metaphor, if we're to be more precise. In verse 3, he is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. Are human beings any different? from this? We know that the answer is no. They too, as with all of God's creation, have been designed with purpose to bear fruit in keeping of, with what it means to be a human being, uh, to prosper in all that we do, in all of our ways in keeping with how God assigned us to be on this planet, and to bear the kind of fruit that we should. But in, even in saying these things, is this 
a description of the ordinary human being, of, of most human beings that we've seen. And no, the answer, of course, is no. Because people generally don't become what they're supposed to be and therefore don't bear the kind of fruit that they could have. And the reason why is evident from this illustration, the illustration of the tree. They're not rooted close to the water. They're not rooted to that close to that which will allow the fruition of the tree to take place. Trees are not able to walk, even though in our imagination we've considered that possibility. Of course, they are locked into where they're sown and born, but the same can't be said for human beings. And so not only do we have the power of choice which God has granted us, we have the power to go according to the choices that we make. And so in keeping with the metaphor, we are trees that can walk. And so since we can walk and make decisions about our lives, where are we choosing to place the roots of our souls? Is it nearby, close to, life-giving, soul-nourishing, fruit-producing, riverbanks? Or is it where things are dry and parched and where there is really ultimately no life to speak of? The soul that comes back to life is the soul that drinks in the life-giving waters of the Word of God. You know, Psalm 19, verse 7 puts it this way, The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul, right? Bringing it back into animation from having been dead. This can't be said for the wicked, the psalmist tells us. In verse 4, he tells us what the result with the wicked who are not by the water's edge is like. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. The wicked who have no interest in the Word of God, where they would have been able to mine all of this precious nourishment for their souls, choose instead to go where their souls will dry up like chaff that the wind drives away. It, it speaks and describes a soul that is wasted away, that has been deteriorating into nothingness. There is no leaf, there is no fruit, there is no sign of life. And what an unspeakable tragedy is to imagine that you're placed into this world, you're launched into this world and nothing of the potential purposes that were assigned to you ever come to be. And your life exists, here you are, but it's just slowly wasting away into meaninglessness. It, had, it has made no difference except maybe for the worst that you have come and appeared in this life. And ultimately, your life just dries and becomes subject to the powers and to the forces that be the wind driving away the dry uh, uh, chaff that has lost its strength. It has no weight left. It has dried and disintegrated. Men trees, however, according to our psalmist, go by the riverbank of God's word where needful moisture enters the soil of his soul. Thirdly, where a man tree walks determines his final destiny. Verses 5 and 6. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. There's a natural law that governs all things. That which you sow is what you reap. Choices have consequences. 
It's never been any other way. You know, from the day that we enter into this world, it's one of the major lessons that we begin to learn. A leads to B and B leads to C. There is never a non-chain reaction where one thing happens not connected to another thing. All things happen in connection with what has happened before. And so from the day we enter into this world, kind of by default, we begin to learn this. That choices have consequences. And of those possible consequences, none are greater than those that affect our futures and ultimately determine our destiny. Think about this. I'm going to repeat this. Of those possible consequences, none are greater than those that affect our futures and determine our destiny. The consequences of wickedness are here played out and demonstrated and shown by the psalmist so as to be clear to see. Therefore, the psalmist says, meaning as a consequence of the wicked being nothing like the righteous man who invests his roots by the river water, by the river bank, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, verse 5, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. Now, the wording here might be a little bit, um, well, it can lead to misunderstanding. It, it says the wicked will not stand in the judgment. It doesn't say the wicked will not stand judgment. It doesn't mean that the wicked will not be judged. It means that all that they will try to bring forth in the day of judgment as a defense for them, it will not be sufficient. The overwhelming uh, evidence is that they are found guilty due to the choices that they have made in life. There is to be an accounting when all is said and done is, you know, if we go from Genesis to Revelation in Scripture, and one of the strongest elements in it is that there is an accounting, that God judges, that God will weigh the, the, the quality of our lives when all is said and done. When this life has run its course, God will inspect the deeds attached to the choices of our lives. We are moral beings, and as moral beings, we make moral choices which will give a moral accounting of those choices. You know, it's a terrifying thing. We speak of God as being love, and He is, of being gracious, and He is, of, of being uh, 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 kind, and He is, but to fall into the hands of a holy God when this life is said and done, when we haven't minded him, when we've rejected him, when we had a choice before us that would have been better and we continually chose the, the things that were wrong, it's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of a holy God. Revelation 20, 11 to 13. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it the earth and the heavens fled from his presence and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. Choices have consequences. And then it says, back to Psalm uh, 1, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous, that is, when the, the wicked are judged, they will not be permitted to belong to the same group, to the same section as that of the righteous. Where God gathers the righteous, he will not gather the wicked. They are in a state of forfeiting that which belongs to the righteous who made the choices wisely. 
in this life. And this is what Jesus meant when he said in Matthew 25, 30, in, in a parable where he said, throw that worthless servant into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is a description of one who is not permitted to belong, who is not permitted to partake, who is not permitted to enter the realms of blessing in the afterlife. On the outside, looking in. If there was no desire for righteous things here, then why should there be any later choices have consequences. And to choose to be away from the things of God continually, a rejection of God, a rejection of His Word, deliberately so. We're not talking about ignorance here. We're talking about those of us who know this exists, who know God exists, and believe it to be so. But again and again, it doesn't matter he doesn't govern our choices. This doesn't govern our choices. And they, again and again, we enter into the choices, the, the desires, the directions that please us. In the end, all of this will be evaluated and considered and weighed by a holy God. And the problem that the wicked have is that the 10-star hotels in heaven have no reservations for the wicked and they are left in what Jesus calls outer darkness. I want to conclude by saying some things belong together. Dead souls and dead trees. Dead souls because of the dryness of sin and dead trees because of the dryness of soil. They go together. Neither of them is attached to life. And uh, Scripture describes the natural man as being dead in their trespasses and sins. Dead trees and dead souls, one belonging with the other. But something incredible happened 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, Jesus, a living soul, the only living soul, walked toward a tree, not a live tree, not one that looked in its shape like a tree anymore, but one that had been cut down and shaped into a cross. And he walked toward that cross to take our place a place where dead souls belong because that's where a dead tree was. And then a miracle happened. Jesus dying on that tree, the source of life. Jesus, the source of life, the living soul, a life-giving spirit, Scripture says, touched the cross and the cross came to life. That which was meant as an instrument of death to bring about the termination of a human life now had the power by virtue of the, of the divine Son of God touching it to bring the dead to life. It's to the cross that our sins must go to die. And where our souls now free of the death of our sin begin to live begin to live. You know, in the Garden of Eden, talking about trees, there was a tree called the tree of life. I just mentioned that in the book of Revelation chapter 20, where it says the tree of life, there was the book of life, rather. Jesus, because of the cross, because of what took place on the cross, because of the emblematic uh, uh, truth and value of the cross being. This is why you see in Scripture sometimes it said that Jesus uh, died on the tree because of because it came from uh, the, the cross came from a tree, and we we see that the tree of life, as described, excuse me, in Genesis, is ultimately who Jesus is. Go to Jesus and live.
one day when God opens the, the books of judgment, if we are in Jesus, we are in the book of life. And being in the book of life means this. It means that the other books will be closed as it concerns us. The books that have recorded our deeds and misdeeds in this life, they are of no account anymore. God will no longer weigh what we've done in this life if we are in Jesus. Do you know what God weighs? God weighs his life. And God weighs his deeds. And God weighs his merits and his righteousness. Ours falls short again and again and again. But that of Jesus never did, never has, never will. And so our the decision that is made concerning our souls is placed on that of whom Jesus is. Who he is is what matters most in the end. So we need to place our faith in him. We need to transfer our trust from ourselves, our reliance on our, on our track records to that of Jesus. And God the Father will consider the righteousness of Jesus as being our righteousness in the end. I want to close with one psalm. It's Psalm 92, only uh, four verses, verses 12 to 15. The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon, planted in the house of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green proclaiming the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no wickedness in him. Be trees that walk first to the life-giving power of God's Son, then to the life-nourishing power of God's Word. God bless you. Let's pray. Father, you have put everything in motion that we needed. You've given us everything necessary for us to thrive in this life. You did not put us here for no reason. You have assigned fruitfulness in, in, as a result of the choices that we make if we abide by your will, if we consider your commands if we go into what your heart beat is and allow it to transfer into our own as, so that that becomes our heartbeat, so that that becomes the thing that drives us forward, the thing that is of greatest value to us. And to that end, Father, you have given us your word that we might know, that we might see, that we might be transformed by what we receive and, and internalize. And so, Father, we ask for, for this mercy of allowing us, of, of creating in us a greater desire for you and your word, that by your word we might be changed, that by your word we might become the children of blessing, even as this psalm describes it. Grant us grace towards this end. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. I come to the garden alone Why did you stand on the roses And the voice I hear falling on my ear The Son of God is close Big sad.
Sweet Harry, there none other is ever. 